Hello, everyone, and welcome to a slightly different version of Al Jazeera's The Stream. Today, we're giving you, our online viewers, a web exclusive in collaboration with Al Jazeera correspondent Huda Abdul Hamid and a few members of our audience who um, are joining us in a Google Plus Hangout. So the topic of today is Libya on the line. The conversations Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi didn't want the world to hear. Huda obtained more than 12,000 recordings of Gaddafi, Saif al-Islam, his son, and other top Libyan officials. Um, and she's here today to talk about them, give us a little insight in the behind the scenes reporting, um, and answer questions from our Google Plus Hangout and, of course, from Twitter. Um, if you'd like to tweet in, feel free. Uh, the hashtag we're using is hashtag Libya on the line. Um, so I'll start by just going around our Hangout and having everyone introduce themselves. Alham, why don't you go ahead? Uh, good evening. I'm Ilham Saudi. I'm the director of Lawyers for Justice in Libya, which is an NGO dedicated to the promotion of human rights and the rule of law in Libya. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks for being here. And Mohammed. Hello. Yeah, I'm Mohammed. I'm an undergraduate student at uh, the University of Essex. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to join the, the hangout. <laughs> And Mohammed, where were you before Essex? I, uh, I well, I'm originally from Midrata. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Um, so I know you guys have seen some of the clips, and of course for our audience that's watching out there, um, you, if you were watching this channel, have also seen the clips um, on the Al Jazeera channel and on YouTube. Um, and of course, if you've missed them, you can always go to aljazeera.com where they're there um, in all their entirety. There's also a timeline of recordings based on date. Um, put together by our awesome web team. Um, so I'm going to get the ball rolling. Huda, you have been a reporter um, in conflicts and war kind of all over the world for many years. So some might say that you have kind of seen it all. So on the back of that, what surprised you the most about these recordings? Uh, well, many things surprised me the most. Uh, the first one being that I have covered um, the Libyan uh, revolution uh, from always the uh, opposition side at the time. So I was in the East, I was in Misrat, I was in the Western Mountains, but I had never, never, never seen uh, the other side. Uh, also, throughout that conflict, all you had was that image that was being portrayed on uh, the uh, Libyan state TV at the time, the Jamahiriya. Uh, so you always had these you know, messages of defiance and calls for the supporters of Gaddafi to go and crawl uh, over this city and that city, but you never really heard any kind of real conversation. So in that sense, it was quite fascinating because these were really 24-7 uh, recordings, um, you know, they were talking about everything from the most mundane to some real situations to what to do. I have to say, though, that, uh, you know, these recordings are the system recording itself. Mm -hmm. And then the players, as we call them, whether it's the Prime Minister, Abdullah Sanusi, or Gaddafi himself, know that. And so they don't tell you everything on the phone. Many of the phone calls were complete riddles to me. Uh, it was obvious that they were meeting maybe in the evening, uh, deciding things, and then following up next day. So we have hundreds of conversations that were just, uh, you know, I couldn't decipher them. They were complete riddles. They were spoken in very vague terms. They knew what they were talking about, but we just could not figure that out. And I think, and I think also the, these conversations give you a more complete understanding of what happened uh, on, uh, during those eight uh, very uh, terrible months for the Libyan people. Um, and uh, so in that sense, it was very interesting. Um, well, Mohammed, I, I want to direct this next to you because mm -hmm. you're a Libyan who's living in diaspora. And of course, you've, you said earlier to me that you, after finishing your studies in the UK, want to go back to Libya. So um, after seeing a little bit of these clips and hearing Hadez speak right now, what's your feeling? And, and what questions do you have um, after seeing this? Well, to be honest, I, I didn't quite manage to, to hear all of the uh, records, but, but uh, all I can say is, is uh, it's not going to affect my, my decision to, to go back to my country. And I don't mind as long as the country is uh, in, a, in a good 
position is a, is, is, is a little bit stable, so I don't mind. I think all I'm going to do is finish my study and go back and work for my, my own country. And, yeah, so... And, and um, uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but during the uprising, um, what, what was your role? What were you doing? So I was, I was a fighter in the front line, just like anyone. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was, I was just fighting like anyone else. So yeah. We just had, like, well, I'm gonna interrupt you there because just like anyone else, I mean, for our viewers that that you know are not or have not gotten a chance to see what these uprisings are like, that is kind of unusual. So, um, Hoda, are, are, did you see uh, instances like this where people from abroad would come and you know felt like this was their duty? This is just what you. This is just what happens. Absolutely. Um, I saw people who, young people like him, who really dropped everything they were doing uh, wherever they were living and came there and went to the front line and we have to say they had really no experience of war and you had an enemy who was willing to do absolutely everything to try to keep uh, mm -hmm. power. And so people, you saw people uh, like Muhammad, and I have to say it was very touching. And sometimes we would turn around among journalists and say, "Man, he's courageous. He doesn't. He's never held a gun in his life before, and he is, here he is in front of a front line where the fighting is directed." by the sons of the leader who have a very personal stake because it's not only the leader who's losing here, it's the entire family that's losing out. So they're willing to do everything to keep uh, that. And actually in the phone conversations you also discover that. They're all the time talking about whatever way they can have to keep power. So it goes from the most, um, I would say, in naive ways, uh, are ways of, there's one conversation mm -hmm. where I heard them discussing whether they should find a Western journalist who's living, who is, at, who is in Tripoli, uh, maybe they can win him over, pay him a hundred thousand dollars and send him to the East so he could actually, uh, you know, do his job as a journalist from the East but also send them information about the movement of the fighters on the front line there and also send them profiles about who these fighters were. So people like Muhammad were taking huge risks, not only on the, you know, on the fighting risk and the, what can happen on the front line, but also risks uh, that could have very long ramification if things had turned differently. Right, right. Um, uh, it, Muhammad, do you have thoughts on that? Is that how you, you felt? Like, I mean, you were putting your life yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, because I left, I left everything I had, like my studies and everything, and I went straight to to my country. I I I went to Benghazi and then from Benghazi to Misrata to the sea. Yeah, sorry, and yeah, so I didn't have no experience, no nothing. But yeah, it's it's all about passion. <laughs> when you got passion, you can do anything. So yeah, and that was. That was my, my aim. Yeah. Well, all about passion. I think one thing that kind of struck me in these tapes is that there was definitely passion on both sides. Um, I want to go to you, Alham, because um, uh, there's a clip, um, and I don't know if you saw it, so in, and for our audience it may not have, um, I will relay a little bit of it um, just uh, uh, verbally. I'm not going to play the clip. But uh, there's a part, uh, there's a recording um, where Saif al-Islam, Gaddafi, uh, Gaddafi's son, of course, is saying, I will send people to liquidate them. Um, and he's speaking to an aide, Tayyib al-Safi, about who he calls traitors. Um, uh, we later had an interview with uh, Luis Marina Ocampo, who is the chief prosecutor of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and he described that as a kill order. Yeah. So um, in directing this question to you, because of course you're the director um, of a legal uh, NGO, um, which you can tell us a little bit more about, what are the legal implications behind this, and are we going to see safe stand trial? Do you think this gives further uh, kind of a push for, um, for that cause? Uh, thank you. That's a, that's a very full question. <laughs> um, I think the first thing I would say is um, it's not the most responsible behavior by Ocampo to make that statement, but we're not used to responsible behavior from him. 
um, as a prosecutor, he really shouldn't be commenting on the validity of evidence that he's heard for the first time um, on television. But that's Ocampo, um, and we can spend um, a lot of time on him, but that's all I think we need to say on him at the moment. Um, I think there is um, a lot of implications to having this kind of evidence, quote unquote, being shown on television. Um, not least that it might hinder its admissibility or its ability to be used as evidence in the courtroom. Um, so although it's fascinating for me to watch as a Libyan and as a viewer, it's, uh, it's troublesome as a lawyer, actually, to watch this because there's a, a multitude of reasons why it's problematic to share this information at the stage. First of all, is um, it makes it questionable as evidence in court. Um, secondly, um, it's a situation where you um, are polluting the environment further um, in the sense that you might, be create, you might diminish whatever independent purpose we might have because you're promoting a, a version of, of a story. Thirdly, it gives the defense an opportunity to prepare their, their defense. And so, actually, can, can you hear me? Because it's telling me there's a connection. Well, um, we can. Your, your connection is a little bit choppy, and we the, apologize the, to our viewers for that. that you are coming from Tripoli, but go ahead. We can hear you. Um, yeah, I mean, and I think uh, from the perspective of a Libyan as, a, and as someone who's a, a member of this community, um, I think there's a, one of the biggest dangers of, of, of showing this kind of material preemptively is that it gives the defense an opportunity to create their defense or to, or to actually fill the gaps with their story. And we've actually seen that with Tayyip Asafi who's put out a statement explaining his context for those statements. So it further diminishes its ability to be used um, as... It looks like we might have left Alham, but I, I mean, she was raising some interesting points that I'd like to post to you, Huda, because, you know, as a reporter, um, your job is to tell the story. So was there kind of a conflict um, when you found these and then when you, of course, turned them in? There was a kind of a conflict, but we also did speak to, um, you know, the, uh, to some people in Libya while we were uh, shooting, you know, the stories Hello? there. And Hi, uh, Ham. Well, welcome back. I'm just having Khoda respond uh, to some of the, the, thing, the issues that you raised. And okay. we also uh, spoke to uh, Ocampo and to other people. Now, the prosecutor general in Libya uh, does have a much, much stronger case, of course, than our uh, clips and a few second clips. Uh, there's, you know, paper evidence, which is much more admissible in court, from, from what I understand and from what I was explained, than a, a phone recordings, because apparently for phone recordings, you also need to have witnesses, you need to have people authenticated in a very scientific mm -hmm. way, I would mm -hmm. say. Uh, so, uh, yeah. but they already believe that they have a very, very strong case against uh, Saif al-Islam. Now, Ocampo has said uh, to us at some point that this, was, this is interesting, but I think it just adds to their case rather than do anything. And if it chips away, from what I understand, it doesn't chip away much compared to the you know, written documents, signed documents, direct orders, which are all documented, which the Prosecutor General says he has. Alham, could you hear that? Do you have a, do you, do you want to respond? Yeah. I, mean, I think one of the... No, I could. And obviously, it's, you know, it's, it's very good television. It's, um, and, I, and I applaud. It's, it's now the sort of, um, the, what, the shortcut... To, to build a case without these recordings. Um, what these recordings could do is the ability to hold a fair trial in the first place. So, for example, as we all know at the moment, the, the Libyan uh, government is, is, has put in an admissibility they they've, they've asked to be able to try by um, Saif al-Islam in, for you to be able to do through that, you need to demonstrate, but demonstrate to give an example, that you, it would be very to have a sufficiently difficult dependent judiciary, find an independent, now if this was a sent jury, when situation where he was going to be programmed like this, with this kind of evidence that's very incriminatingly accused, 
in Libya, it won't, won't be a jury trial, so it's a slightly different point, but we're still looking for our judges who at best will have a problem um, detaching because all of us were involved in this conflict to add further evidence that pre, pre, um, presumes a lot up front um, will be a hindrance to us being able to hold a fair trial in Libya if we trial in Libya or attempt to have a trial in Libya. So that's my concern as a lawyer. What I would want is if we country that we don't then jeopardize its fairness because we are um, polluting if like the population that from which we have to select our independent judiciary to, to trial. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's really wonderful to have these programs again, and I'll say this again, but, you know, crime, crime and war and evidence um, are not always necessarily entertainment. Right, right. Um, sorry, I, I, I think we need to keep that in mind. So I'll add one more. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, I, I want to apologize once again because the connection is a little bit choppy. This is a very emotive topic. So this big. This is a very, very emotive topic. Right. Um, case. That's because the, the chief prosecutor in Tripoli says he has an even stronger case and because all of us as Libyans will imagine first you know have our own perception of what happened and, and we, we you know we think we know what happened to then hide expectations more with, with, with this will make it very difficult. that's where difficult for judicial there is already very 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 high expectations in it and not Libya of these comes out and says to he has an airtight opinion one way or another in a case. And so, as much as when I switch off my lawyer brain, All right. Um, we seem to have lost Malika. We're just waiting for Diga to join back in. Um, but while we're waiting, uh, I think we're doing Malika's back in. Oh, there we go. So Malika's back in. Malika, welcome back. Hi, thank you very much. And apologizing once again. This is an experiment. We're trying this out. And all of our internet connections um, don't exactly want to cooperate with us today. Um, but this is a, it's a fun experiment, like I said. Um, so as I was saying, I I'm, I'm apologize for cutting off Elham. Her internet connection is a bit choppy. Um, I think we got the gist of what she was trying to say, and I think she raised a lot of interesting points. Um, I would like to shift the discussion a little bit um, towards something that I know people are wondering, which is, Huda, how did you get these recordings? Um, and what was that process like? Because I know beforehand there was, there was news that the opposition had recordings, and they'd already released some of them. Um, uh, out. This is during the uprising, but this is a lot more than what was, you know, what we heard then. So, how did you get these? Um, how do I get it? Let's say through a contact. Uh, after spending so much time in Libya, you do also um, build trust with people. They trust your reporting, and so that's how that came about. Um, how we went about it, I have to tell you. When it first arrived, we were, uh, you know. I got this hard disk and I started transferring onto my laptop and when I saw the numbers going of how many clips there were, um, I was taken aback. I was like, okay, now what do we do with that? Uh, we had to go through a long process of even trying to understand who was speaking, what they were talking about. I have to say, um, I'm Egyptian. I, I understand Arabic very well. I'm fluent. Uh, sometimes the Libyan accent can... I don't fully understand full of it. So some of these players were also talking between themselves and very quickly and I couldn't understand. So we had to bring our brilliant producer, Suleiman, um, from Libya to come here. And poor guy, he sat six weeks in a tiny room with speakers just logging and listening and trying to put the puzzle together. Uh, because at some times it was puzzles. There were nicknames, uh, there were people, we, we couldn't figure out who was who, and then once in a while someone would slip while they were talking and figure out, oh, that's that one person. 
Um, it was very interesting also because Suleiman, uh, who's a Libyan, uh, who um, we met in Benghazi when we first arrived, had actually gone to the street. He was a protester. He had been um, detained by the uh, Gaddafi forces in Benghazi, and he was only freed after Benghazi fell. So this was a, a guy who took part into those protests that then snowballed into a full time, a full scale revolution. And I was watching him as we were doing it, and sometimes he was so angry at what he was hearing. Sometimes he was laughing about it. Uh, sometimes, you know, I think because of we have the hindsight element here. Uh, he was very happy that one of the cunning plan was not working or hasn't worked out. So it was a very, very interesting process, but very long and tedious at times as well. I bet, I bet. Um, oh, oh, well, you mentioned that you had to go to your Libyan uh, producer. I'm wondering, Hoda, did you have any questions or um, things that you thought about that you'd like to ask um, Mohammed, because you were there with Libyan fighters, you were amongst them when you were reporting, okay. of course, you were there for many months. Yes. Um, but was there anything that you can think of now in hindsight, um, a question that you'd pose to Mohammed here in our Google Plus? Yeah, I, I always wondered, I mean, I don't know how long you were there. Uh, Mustrata was very different than any other front line in Libya, because basically once you arrived in Mustrata, and I went like you, Mohammed, by boat from Benghazi, but once you're in there, you can't really do anything, right? You're in there. The only way to escape uh, is to try to swim if there's no boat. That was your really only way. It Too took bad. a long, long, long time to push from uh, especially Daphne to Zulitan. It took months. Um, yes. It was hot. It was Ramadan. There were bad days. I remember very well, especially on the yeah. first day of Ramadan, uh, there was quite a bad, uh, as you call it in Libya, iltifaf, or flanking in English. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a very bad start for Ramadan, I remember. Did sure. you at any time think, uh, oh, because you were, I mean, I thought so but also, but that, oh my God, this is going to take forever. Uh, he is, you know, it's not going to be so easy, or did you never lose hope? I, I never, I never lost hope, because I, uh, because we knew that we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna win. We're gonna have we're gonna have it. We're gonna have our freedom. But the point is we we don't know we don't, we the <laughs> the problem we had is with the with the rockets, you know. Because we couldn't do nothing for, for for the rockets that were that were launching from far away distance, like from from us, from where we were. Those we didn't have no nothing to 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 deal with them. So. That was the only problem, but for us, we, we never lost hope. Yeah, we knew that we, we, we're going to win sooner or later. It's just a matter of time. It might, it might get longer and longer, but then it's just for sure. We knew for sure that we're going to have it, and yeah. Well, were, Mohammed, were there ever times when you were really scared for your life? You know, I mean, these are dangerous situations. Were there times that you thought, I know we're going to win, but this is too dangerous for me to be in right now. Yeah, because I, I, <laughs> I would say you'd have to be a little bit scared sometimes, careful, not scared. But he's, I already submitted my life when, when I was there. I, I had submitted my life that I, was, I might not come back. I might, I might lose my life. But yeah, that's it. So I, I, I didn't really mind whether I, I die or not. I, just <laughs> were your family members all fully in support of this? Yeah, yeah, they were, yeah. So, yeah. Hey, um, Malika, this yes, go ahead, Heather. I have to say, you know that saying, if there is a will, there's a way? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the Libyan fighters really proved that day after day after day. Let's not kid ourselves. The enemy was willing to go at great lengths uh, to do what to keep power. The enemy was an organized uh, military machine that had a lot of money and a lot of power. And it was scary. I mean, Mohammed can say what he wants. It was scary on the front line many times. At least I was. And I ran away more than once. Um, yeah. And it's just incredible yeah. how they never really lost the resolve. I mean, I think there was a 
I think they were also driven by an idea that the front line and what was going on there, were the, the rockets and the mortars and the ground missiles that were falling there were still better than an eventual return of the government uh, in Misrata, in the east, or in the places that they took. Uh, this was a moment they were looking for since a long time. It hasn't turned, let's quote unquote, as peaceful as Tunisia or Egypt. Uh, but the man they were dealing with was not was quite different, also. Um, yeah. And I think the fear of a return of the government and its forces and its security apparatus and its intelligence uh, to those areas was probably greater than being on the front line. At least that's that's how I felt sometimes when talking to these young fighters. Is that how you felt, Hamad? No, no, no. I, I feel I different, to, to be honest. I, I mean, to put it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, let's, uh, let's let Mohammed finish and then I'll go straight to you and Ham. Yeah, because our main concern was Gaddafi and his companions, yeah? That, that was our main aim and we didn't, we didn't really think about the post-war the post -war actions or whatever. So, yeah, we were, we, were, we were afraid that it might take a long time cause, because he, like, he was getting aid from, from other countries from, yeah, when we... We managed to get, we managed to capture quite lots of many mercenaries or foreign soldiers. So that was that was a little bit of concern, but then nothing really, nothing really concerned us apart from that. <laughs> Two burying sides of war. Um, Ilham, you wanted to say something. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's um, just to put it in almost visual terms. Um, I don't. I never thought in my life that us as living as, as anyone would actively pray and actively welcome a nation that bombs your country. I mean, no one wants that. And there were groups of Libyans all around the world, including in Libya, sitting around doing their maps and calculating the numbers of how many votes are needed to get this bombing starting. And it's the most surreal, surreal experience that I wish on no one to sit in your living room bodies to vote to bomb your country because that's how desperate you are. I, I, I don't know if people can even fathom that emotion. It's just a very, very, very surreal moment where you are so desperate and you know that unless, unless you fight back physically, it's game over for all of us in the diaspora. In Libya, Gaddafi never respected borders in his terror. So he wasn't going to now and in fact, a lot of the people who were active in the diaspora had very obvious files when we went into Libya on the work they were doing in this conflict to liquidate, to use that very surreal thing for us as activists to, pro to actively be asking for a military intervention, especially after Iraq and every other experience we've had in the Middle East. So that anything puts it in more of, of how bad the situation was and you know, I know a lot of my family members that went to the front line, this phrase we kept hearing over and over is, we're dead either way, we might as well die fighting. I think that's really poignant and I think um, uh, that's something that from the outside you, you hear and it's um, heart-wrenching but also understandable when you have fighters. But then you, on the other, on the other hand, you have reporters um, who were also definitely being targeted. Um, Hada, I know that there is an instance in, in the recordings where they mention you by name. Um, yeah. There's a quote, it was a good ambush. And I think there's also something saying, you know, that Al Jazeera were still the number one story and this is something that they had to deal with. Um, these are government officials and this is Saif al Islam and this is Tayyib al Safi. So, you know, hearing that now, what, how does that make you feel? I have to say, when we heard the clip, Suleiman and I kept on, you know, replaying it and replaying it and replaying it until Suleiman said, come on, stop it, there's only one Hoda at Al Jazeera. Um, yeah, they were good, as you know, they were, they had, they had uh, put a tra set up a trap for the fighters, the fighters had advanced, um, the, and they came back all wounded, some of them, badly wounded. We find them on the side of the road. 
they they explained what that trap was. Which basically, that trap was is that some of these, um, let's say, regular army soldiers had waved some white flags. Uh, so they advanced, thinking that these regular soldiers were going to switch sides. And as they came close, they hit them uh, very much. So we left these guys. We went a bit forward just to see what was happening. And that's where, again, uh, we managed to escape thanks to a very, very, very good um, Libyan staff who understood very quickly that we were falling into that same trap. Uh, I was a bit surprised to hear that actually someone had told Saif al-Islam that they had been captured. And that probably ties back to what I said earlier, that there was a whole network, vast web of informants that were absolutely everywhere. Uh, who were calling from everywhere, uh, but some of them were just blatantly lying. And in this instance, I'm very lucky that they were lying. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and of course, uh, we remember our former colleague who was also killed in this from Al Jazeera Arabic, uh, Ali Hassan Al Jabir, um, yeah. who was one of the first, uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Hada, one of the first reporters uh, to die in this Libyan conflict. Yeah, and he was the liberty target. I think other reporters were not the liberty targeted. Uh, he was deliberately targeted. I had breakfast with him that morning mm -hmm. uh, at the Uzo Hotel in Benghazi. And then uh, he went to do his day, and it's only in the afternoon that we find out what happened. Um, it was very unfortunate. I think there was an obsession, and in the tapes you, you hear it, there was an obsession with Al Jazeera. Uh, with the media in general. At a certain point, there's a phone conversation uh, where they're discussing with Musa Ibrahim and uh, another official, and I don't want to say any mistakes, but and I'm not going to say the name of the other official, I can't remember who mm -hmm. it was exactly, but he was clearly saying, listen, we need to focus on the good media, uh, the good media for them being uh, several channels, uh, I really, I mean, I'm just quoting here. I am not talking about anyone bad. But there was Russia Today. But there was some Nicaraguan journalists, some Venezuelan journalists. Uh, there were some channels that were good. And then there were us, the bad people. And uh, we were there. We were the worst of the worst for them. So, um, you know, they, they were, we were being insulted a lot in these uh uh, wiretaps, but that's the way it is at the end of the day, you know, you can't always be everybody's friend, and it's not your job to be anyone's friend. Right. So, you know, and on the other hand, we had people on the front line uh, who, you know, were willing to protect us, were, were willing, you know, they would have done anything for, for our well-being, and that was one of the most uh, heartwarming experiences, and I think that's why I stayed uh, throughout the entire uh, revolution in Libya because people were so nice on the other side. And as much as we were getting insulted by the government, um, the other side uh, was incredible. I mean, there's all this catering service on the front line, which was incredible. We were just following the front line into the desert. Uh, supplies were diminishing, but you didn't have to worry about it because there was always someone stopping and giving you food and water and drinks. I mean, it was just incredible. The solidarity of the Libyan people in such a difficult moment was something I have seen nowhere else, I have to say. Right, that's terrific. Um, that's terrific. And actually, before uh, we come to the end of this really fascinating talk, I kind of want to bring up one point and get the thoughts of Elham and Mohammed. Um, there's an instance in, in one of the recordings um, where Al Safi, I think it is, is saying um, after one caller tells him that their location has been struck and uh, it's a building where they used to meet, um, Al Safi says, We need to put children there um, and take the media there in the evening. Um, and I think that's something that struck a lot of our online community because we put these tweets out saying what's in the recordings. There's a tweet here from Hind um, at Libya Liber Liberty, she calls herself. Um, she says, Crazy, compelling stuff to hear the actual phone calls of the Gaddafi Mafia's counter-revolution campaign. Um, so, Mohammed, and uh, I'll start with you um, and then go to you, Alham. Is this how you're feeling? Is, is being able to hear these behind-the-scenes recording of Gaddafi and these other high officials, is, is that surprising to you? Is this revealing? How do you feel? 
it's it's not it's not really surprising because I <laughs> I would I would always I'd, I'd have always felt that Gaddafi is is a gangster. He would have, he would have done anything he could, uh, and he would have yeah. And it, it wasn't really surprising. I mean, he 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 has done more worse worse than that, and he yeah, where where he used to bring people into his own compound and yeah, so that wasn't. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Not surprising. Um, and Elham, what about you? No. No, I. I mean, I think it's it's um it's a an obvious tactic to make um because it's you know it's uh, it's he 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 knew the law, and so he knew that targeting um a place where there are civilians would be a problem, and because they were using. <laughs> Civilian buildings. It, it wasn't unintentional that they kept using civilian buildings for their, their meetings. I mean, it's, it's one of the, the most secure ways to protect yourself when you are someone who's um, breaking the law. And um, it, it, you know, and, and coupled that with the fact that everyone is using media now to put forward their case, it makes perfect sense to use, use that. I think the the problem we we had with with the Gaddafi regime is that it seemed to very frequently use Civilian, and so not they had their meetings there, but they also stored a lot of um, arms in civilian um, targets. And actually, we know a lot of the people from the human rights community were used as um, to scare us off as activists, because one, when they had the big images for flags, a lot of the close-ups they would show would be people that we knew as human rights activists who had been captured, working, of, working on these issues that. You know, we got your colleagues, and they're here, and we're making them wave some flags. And so, it's a it's a sort of a very quiet nudge to us to what we're doing when other people who didn't know those people wouldn't notice it. So I'm not surprised that that was a tactic that was utilized. It was utilized in many forms by the regime um, in ways that show how knowledgeable they were of the. And Hoda, any last thoughts from you? Last thoughts for me. I have to say <laughs> it's been a long time. I what I just want to say about what Elham was just saying now. Uh, I think, you know, Elham is looking at it from a Libyan perspective. They they grew up in that environment, so probably she won't be so surprised to hear uh, that you know they were using civilian buildings or they were how good their propaganda machine was and what lengths they were willing to go uh, to show that they were the victims. Um, the rest of the world probably doesn't know that as much. So you'll always have, I think, a different uh, perspective mm. when it comes to these things. Elham comes from a situation from inside, uh, from living that experience. I don't know if you agree with me or not, Elham, but the rest of the world probably doesn't have that whole, uh, let's say, vision of it all or experience. Yes, no, they're, they're, they're lucky not to have lived under <laughs> that regime. Yes. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> They're yeah. lucky not to have I that think, you know. experience. It's it's a blessing not to have that experience. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and Mohammed is also smiling there, isn't he? Yeah. Well, I will uh, it's second. It's over now, that. though. It's over now. <laughs> it's over now, and and interesting times yeah. to come in Libya for sure. Um, as we've seen with recent news, yes, inshallah. Um, so I want to thank all of our guests, of course, for being with us. Alham Saudi, Mohammed Kharayat, of course, Hada Abdul Hamid. Um, this has been great. This is a great discussion. And of course, for those of you that are watching it out there on Google Plus, um, this recording will be up on our website at aljazeera.com, um, where you can also find uh, the rest of the recordings, Libya on the line. Um, behind the scenes recordings of Libyan uh, former officials uh, and the late Mohammed Gaddafi. So this has been a pleasure. Um, I want to thank you guys for being a part of this experiment uh, in connection with the Al Jazeera's AJ stream and um, hope to do this again in the future sometime. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you.